Hey, Tommy, it's going to be a fun episode because today we're talking about the surprisingly great cars that we've driven. Um, and we've got a list of cars that, well, are surprising. These are cars that you may not initially think are all that cool or all that special, but after living with them, we've come to discover that they're really, really incredible. But before we get into that, let us introduce you to Dirt Legal. Dirt Legal helps owners of dirt bikes, ATVs, and UTVs acquire a state-issued street legal license plate that allows these off-roaders to be driven on the street. So no more need to waste time loading up your truck or trailer, driving it to the trailhead, and then unloading it. You simply can ride or drive straight to the trail. So here's how it works. Send Dirt Legal your bike or UTV's information. Dirt Legal then handles the paperwork with a DMV, all for a few hundred bucks. At the end of the process, you receive a new title, a street legal license plate, and updated title in the mail. Simple, right? To learn more about Dirt Legal and how they can make your off-roading rig street legal, go to dirtlegal.com. That is dirtlegal.com. All right, Tommy, so sometimes manufacturers, uh, either by design or by accident, uh, put some magic in a vehicle, right? They make it a little bit more fun. They make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, and luckily, you know, over the last 10 years, we've driven every new car and truck. And we're going to be talking about trucks. Sorry, Andre, because some of these are also trucks uh, in America. Uh, and there are vehicles that when we get them for a week, we hate to see them go. Well, you say every new car and truck, but I haven't seen a Bugatti Chiron in our driveway uh, uh, recently. <laughs> All right, Bugatti, are you listening? We haven't driven a Bugatti <laughs> Chiron. Uh, there's a bunch of Ferraris that we're missing as well. You know, I don't think we've ever tested a Ferrari in the 11 no. years we've been doing this. It seems like Colorado is not the primary market for Ferraris. Yes, uh, and uh, neither, well, we have, we, we, we did a deal with the dealership where we went to the Ferrari dealership. Although McLaren has sent us a few vehicles, that was pretty cool. And Bentley. Yeah, uh, but we're not here to talk about Bentleys and McLarens. We're here to talk about normal folk vehicles because that's what gets us excited. And the first one is a, well, it's an interesting little crossover. Yes, yeah, so uh, as you guys know, we recently, well, six months ago, purchased a Bronco uh, because obviously that was the vehicle that got all of the limelight. That was the one that uh, was the, out of the box hit for Ford. Uh, but uh, before the Bronco, there was a Bronco Sport, which uh, people kind of poo pooed because it wasn't a Bronco. <laughs> but yet, Tommy, the car is exceptionally good. Dare I say, it's surprisingly great. I think Ford confused a lot of non car people by launching the Sport first because then everyone was like, oh, look, I got my Bronco. And they park it next to a Wrangler. And then the Wrangler people laugh at them. And it's like a, <laughs> it's a whole circle of, of hate. But the Bronco Sport, which is based on the Escape architecture, which is also what is underneath the Maverick, right, is a unibody independent suspension vehicle. It doesn't look like a huge performer on paper, but in the real world, this little box on wheels is great value and a lot of fun off-road. Dare I say, Tommy, that it is one of the best in its class off-roaders. We were expecting it because it's based on an Escape, right, just to be kind of a rebranded Escape where they take a different top and put it on a vehicle that, let's face it, doesn't have any real off-road cred. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, it does. It actually has off-road modes, and those modes actually do things, and those things are actually good. It also has actual off-road hardware, like you can get it with... Uh, factory mounted recovery points and skid plates and it's got this trick rear differential in some of them where it's got twin clutches to distribute the power and it's really really an impressive little ute so it's also a good design do you like the design of it you know i think so i, I love the design of it i think you know with the bronco they nailed that uh retro uh let's say uh balance between modern and retro just right and uh, they took a little bit of that magic and sprinkled it onto the bronco sport so that it also looks both modern and classic at the same time. Plus, Tommy, what's great about it is it's a box and there's a surprising amount of room inside of it for what is really a compact crossover, right? It, it's, it's not a big car. The rear portion of the vehicle, though, I'm going to say it, it is straight out of the Lander or Freelander. Do you remember the Freelander? <laughs> yeah, I remember the Freelander. It yeah. was like this late yeah. 90s, early 2000s small SUV they did. But if you look at like the C pillar, the way it slopes forward, if you looked at the stepped up roof line and the boxy proportions, I see so much Freelander in this vehicle. The good news about the Bronco Sport, though, is that the transmission won't grenade after 300 miles like the Freelanders did. But um, I like the design a lot. You can get it in a bunch of different trims. You can get it pretty affordable if you don't want the off road goodies. You can get it with uh, a little engine, a bigger engine. With turbocharging and it's just a great little all-arounder yeah you know I, I would say that um, 
it follows in the footsteps of a vehicle that was near and dear, at least to my heart, which I tested when we first started TFL, which is a Suzuki SX4, right? That, well. That kind of, well, hold on before you, before you get all like, well. SX4. Yeah. That vehicle kind of, jelly bean. kind of led the way for an off-roady <laughs> compact crossover, right? It had a locking center diff. It was actually, you know. It, it, it had okay. A fake locking center. It was center. not a real, okay. But, but back then, there were no real, like, it was before the Renegade. It was before all yeah. these small uh, compact crossovers became, like, the thing to buy, uh, and Suzuki was ahead of the curve, unfortunately, probably a little bit too far ahead of the curve, but that car also had this interesting use mix of like utility, sportiness, and off-road ability. Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit of a pencil sharpener, uh, <laughs> you know, I still a, a little car. weenie. I, love, I, I do, I okay. love okay. the SX-4. All right. All right. All right. I'll give you this, look, the Kazashi, uh, you know, Suzuki's uh, jet up fighter was not a good idea, but the SX-4 was, and I think if you look at a Suzuki, like the Jimny, right, the other vehicles that they build around the world, they do have good off-road abilities, uh, and the, the I, I still, you know, I'm going to say it, the SX-4 led the way for the Bronco Sport. I will give you the SX4 was brilliant. It was okay off road, like yeah. for what it was, it was pretty fun, and you can upgrade them, lift them, and make them pretty, pretty special. The Bronco Sport though is much better out of the box. Uh, I want to go back to something you said, the Suzuki Kazashi. Yes. Remember in a previous episode, you said it meant mighty wind. It did, what it Kazashi did, translated. It did, it did mean you were pretty far off on that I went, one. I was way off on that. It I means a sign that. of things to come. I googled it after the show. Yeah, a sign of things to come. It like did not mean <laughs> a mighty wind. <laughs> it was a sign of fact that Suzuki pulled out of the market. <laughs> where did you Where did you get mighty wind? I, I don't know. Horse and rider is one. All these Japanese terms are so esoteric. It's easy to get them mixed up. Although, do you remember they did? Oh man, what was that thing called? What was the the Grand Vitara? Yeah, what about the Grand so Vitara? the Grand Vitara was kind of like a Rav Four competitor, yeah. and it was pretty cheap on the inside, and it, I don't know, it just never really in the U.S. had a lot of market penetration. But did you know that vehicle you could get with a low range? It was like the, yes, one of the only yes, in its I own class. One. It was called the Sidekick in America. Well, it was a Grand Vitara in Europe. It was a Sidekick here, and I owned one. You're, show, we, you're, you're showing your age there I, a little bit. The Sidekick it. has been out of the market for quite a I number of decades. I bought it here, and I imported it to Europe, and I drove it around Europe. And it was a really fun little car. Uh, it Sidekick. Had, it, it, it had, you know, it was like it had that magic that um, hopefully these new vehicles also have in that it was utilitarian, like I said, and off-roady and fun to drive. And I suppose that Seal is a recent popular artist as well, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he married to Heidi Klum? <laughs> no, we're really going I have down no a, idea. Down a rat hole. I'm just saying the sidekick is a little. It is a good car, but it's it's not recent history. All right. Well, let's go back to cars that people can buy today, where they don't have to scour Facebook Marketplace <laughs> or Craigslist for one that's got less than three hundred thousand miles. All right. Uh, the next one is also in. I'll just stay in this kind of vein, right? Off roady but utilitarian. Uh, uh, and here's the thing. All right. Uh, oftentimes. Uh, and I was listening to the Consumer Reports podcast, and they were right about this. Oftentimes, and I'll give you the example they used. They said that you're better off to buy a highly contented, in other words, more expensive version of like a, a, a mid, mid uh, not luxury or near luxury car, but what do you call the cars that are kind of like Toyotas? Like what a are, mid-tier? Yeah, a mid-tier car. So you're better off, in this case, the example they use is to buy a Golf R versus an Audi A3. Hmm. Because when you get to near luxury, what ends up happening is that oftentimes the manufacturers will um, uh, decontent the vehicle and use cheaper plastics, right? So you, if you compare like a Golf R to an A3 or an S3, uh, they're very similarly priced. And yet with the Golf R, you're going to get a lot more features, probably better materials. What you are, of course, you, losing is that kind of luxury brand image. So this car falls into that category. What I'm talking about is the Mercedes-Benz uh, GLB. Well, that's a little confusing. So you said you agree with... Luxury, it's a near luxury... You, you, you agree with Consumer Reports, but you recommend a near luxury Mercedes. Yeah, because the GLB <laughs> has... It's not always black and white. The GLB has this magic to it where, once again, they've taken a car, they've made it very boxy, very utilitarian. It's, I think, the smallest car... Potentially with a third row, you can get it with a third row, Ooh, which is crazy. Point. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, and obviously the third row it's more is, of a second and a half row is is for people without legs. But yeah. <laughs> but that's not a big, that's not a big demographic. But for little kids, it works. Uh, it you know has um, the interior quality that 
you'd expect from a Mercedes. So it isn't as decontent as, say, the GLA. Uh, and uh, it's surprisingly practical. And actually, if it wasn't for the darn uh, dual-clutch transmission, it would be good off-road. Now, the first gen of kind of the small Mercedes entry-level crossover, right? Um, I guess you could argue the GLK was kind of the first, a really square one. Right. I like that one. And then they went to the GLA. And the first gen GLA, GLA, it just wasn't very good. I mean, it was really poorly assembled. It was uh, uh, co-developed with Infinity, right? They had that, uh, yeah. that shared platform. And it just didn't feel premium. It didn't drive premium. The ride was too firm. It wasn't very spacious. Now, when they launched the GLB, which was a new vehicle... I agree with you completely. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. We had one at the office recently. You can hold so much stuff in it. It's pretty fun to drive. It kind of looks like a baby G-Wagon. But keep in mind, the new GLA is essentially a GLB with, with a more sloping rear end. Would you get that GLA or the GLB? No, GLB. The GLA doesn't have the magic. Uh, and <laughs> speaking of which, It's the same car. The speaking of which, the GLK, uh, I think, was also a very good car, but it got kind of smeared with that mommy, mommy mobile kind of uh, reputation. And so it, it wasn't, uh, you know, kind of tough and uh, butch and off-roady, whereas I think the GLB is, is more in line with that, uh, and I think that's why I like it a lot. I just like the, the utility of it. I I like the way it looks. I like the way it drives. It's just a really good, um, it's just a really good car. Uh, and I don't know if Mercedes stumbled into it or if they engineered it to be as uh, fun to drive as it is, but it is. But a GLA is not. No, no it's no. the same car. No. It just has a different butt. That's that that you know. That, <laughs> Are like you a, saying the butt makes a car? Is yeah. That your... well, it's like you know what. <laughs> I'll give you another example of the butt making the car. The X3, you know, is a very very good. Uh, kind of, you know, luxury commuter slash uh, utility, you know, vehicle, whereas the, the X4 isn't. So do you prefer Kim Kardashian to Kylie Kardashian then? Is there a... I have no opinion. <laughs> <on time. laughs> that I, throw, I, I throw the Kardashian, <laughs> if I'm being honest, Tommy. Uh, but You're, you see what I'm saying? I mean, no, okay, right, let's be serious for a second. When the thing about a, a crossover or a SUV is the U, right? The sports utility and or sports activity vehicle of it's a BMW. And the second you chop that top where you make it into a coupe-like vehicle, uh, you take all the utility out of it and all of a sudden it becomes a car for like empty nesters. And I think, you know, the best example of that, of course, is the ZDX, right? Which, Fantastic car. Which, which, which I love but completely flopped. <laughs> uh, and the Honda uh, Cross Tour, same problem, right? And so to me, it's like if you're going to go for the utility vehicle, get the sloping, don't get the sloping back, but actually get the vehicle that you can throw your stuff into, your dog into without having to give him a, a you know, a squished haircut every time he's back there or she's back there. Now the commenters are going to be amazed because I agree with you completely. <laughs> okay, good. I do. The only car that needs to exist is the first generation Scion XB. Best vehicle <laughs> ever made. It was small on the outside. It has an enormous amount of space on the inside. It was quirky. It was funky. And yep, that's the only car that ever needs to be built. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this is my time for Roman's rant. Already? Whoa. Oh, yeah, well, let's get to it early. Uh, I, I'm really... Um, I'm, I'm really not thrilled by how all the manufacturers are trying to explore every possible niche. And there are certain niches, there are certain places you should never go. I'll give you an example. You know, in Europe, uh, they're called coupés, right? And the cool thing about a coupé is that it's a two-door vehicle that says that you've got enough money that you don't need a practical four-door vehicle or a crossover so that you can splurge your time and energy into something that is unpractical because that is the kind of person you are. That's how you roll. And the second you add a four-door variant into what should be a two-door, you take the magic out of the two-door. So not only do you wreck the two-door, but then you create a four-door coupe, which is impossible to get in and out of the back seat. Um, incredibly silly looking, in my opinion, uh, and takes the magic out of the four-door and the two-door. Uh, and what you have left is a segment that has been completely decimated by, you know, people trying to create, like, weird versions of cars that should never exist. I think that's a kind of a funny thing, though, because um, I do agree. I think that the, the, the what is it, the four-door version of the two-door version of the four-door car doesn't make a lot of sense. However, one of the early... 
entrance into that class was the first gen Audi A7. Do you remember the A7? And I just thought that was such a good looking car. It was incredible. Yeah, I don't it was think four I, I, door. I, I, it was I agree sleek. with you, but it it hasn't exactly aged well. Oh, it's aged beautifully. Oh, All of so. those I like think I look at those old eight sevens, and I loved it at the time because it reminded me of a, like a big version of the RX7 I had. Uh, but now I look upon it, and I think it's kind of uh, ugly duckling. My opinion is that all those early 2010s Audis yeah. are just stunning now. I um, think from the front, the A7 is beautiful, uh, but from the back, yeah, I'm not sure. I think they've all aged well. Like, ever since Audi introduced the uh, first-generation R8s, like in the late 2000s, um, all of those cars, the A5 of that era, the A7, the, the R8 especially, I think they've aged beautifully. And they're cheap now. You can get them for really affordably. They're fairly reliable for what they are. And I just love them. I think that they're great values. And the new ones, I mean, if you look at the new ones, a brand new A7 is not that different from an A7 from seven, eight years ago. Uh, sure, the LEDs have gotten a little bit more refined, but the overall shape, the proportions are pretty similar. All right, let me give you another example in my rant of cars. Once upon a time, there was a thing called a hot hatch. Remember the hot hatches? Yep. Uh, these were, these were, you know. It still exists. Th yeah, th these were things like the Golf R, the WRX, and that'll be interesting because it has changed. The STI, I'm talking about the classic ones, right? Uh, the uh, Focus RS. And then for some reason, the manufacturers decided that hot hatches should be either not hatchy or have a trunk. Like when the STI, you know, got rid of the hatch and went to a trunk. Why? Why? I mean, the, the magic, once again, in the yeah. hot hatch was that, that you was had a vehicle stupid. that you could go on the weekends and, and bomb around uh, and show off to your friends. And then on the weekdays, if you wanted to move a refrigerator, you could put it into the back of this thing, right, and use it as a practical car. And then when they put a trunk on it, and like with the case of Subaru, made it only available with a trunk, I was like, why? This is stupid. All of a sudden, you've got this really cool concept that now has become like, you know, a sedan on steroids. Would you prefer what Ford did, where they got rid of the Fiesta ST, the Focus ST, the Focus RS, and then did the Edge ST, the Explorer ST? No, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking about the, 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 the form factor, not the, you know, not the class of vehicle that they turned into. So I'm talking about taking a hot hatch and making it into either a fake hatch, right, because some of them are fake, right, where it looks like it's a, it's, a, it's a sedan, but then the whole thing opens up. Right, it actually has a hatch, but it's not a it's not a horizontal. It's not a vertical hatch. It's a more of a horizontal hatch. And Honda Civic does the same thing. Well, what about like the um, Golf GTI? Still a hatchback? Finally, yes. That's right. What, I love the Golf GTI and I love the Golf R. I think those are two that have actually stuck with that formula. Veloster N still a hatchback? Still a hatchback. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. imagine like a Veloster N with a you know with a trunk. It would be weird. They make it. It's called the Elantra N. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> it's fantastic. It's a different name. It's, it's lovely. They, they, no, it's not like the STI that got a trunk and it, it used to be a hatch. Yeah, but they, I mean, they've been doing that for a look like, like the, the Jetta GLI is essentially a Right, a it's a, it's a, but it's a different car. It, it, they, they, they gave it a different name. I, I'm struggling to think of another example other than the WRX. Can you give yeah, me the another? The Honda Civic did the same thing. Well, you can still get a Honda Civic hatch. Uh, it's still a hatchback. You can still get it, a hatch. It's, it's weird. The, 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 it changes based on... I think if you want a hatch fast one, you have to get the Type R. And right. then if you want the... Um, right. You gotta, but you gotta, it's still a hatchback. But I mean, you gotta it's still get, a four You, gotta, you can get the S versus the Type R. It, it's not as simple. Anyway, uh, that's another one that, that I think you know has become... And then the other thing that's happened is, of course, when we're going back to like the X4M or the X6M, right? Now, now the... Um, Hatch versions of the crossovers have become kind of the hot vehicles, right? Oh, yeah. Right? So, but look at Porsche, right? Porsche doesn't really do like an X4. They do a Macan, which is more of a traditional uh, crossover. Or they do a Cayenne, which is more of a traditional, right? They don't do that weird cut off the back and get rid of the utility. They do now. What's it? What? They do a Cayenne coupe. Do they do a Cayenne coupe? That's yeah. right, they do. Yeah, Yeah. so yeah. Porsche does it too. Yeah. I think I, Germans. I am on the exact same page about the um, the coupe SUVs. I just I don't think they ever made a lot of sense. Like you said, the ZDX didn't make sense. The X6 when it launched didn't make sense. But people buy a lot of them, um, and they're still out there. I mean, Mercedes does the GLE coupes, right? They've got all the, the coupe versions of it. In my opinion, I'd always get the standard square back version, save some money because they're typically cheaper, and then enjoy the extra cargo room. So what about convertible SUVs? I love convertible SUVs. <laughs> Why? They're so weird and unique. <laughs> oh, geez. There's only, what, two? In America, yeah. 
What? There's only, well, the, the Murano Cross, which is gone, right? Well, there's a lot more than two, actually. And then there's the uh, Range Rover of Oak. But like the Wrangler, the Bronco. Yeah, I'm talking about like... <laughs> those yeah. are convertible SUVs too. Right, but you know what I mean. Those That's a whole different... I mean, a Jeep is a Jeep, right? It's not a... It, it, well, then as a uh, Jeep it, owner, it, Tommy... You, is you a Bronco a Jeep too then? <laughs> I'm saying as a Jeep owner, as a Wrangler owner, you don't like it being called a car and you certainly don't like being called a truck. So a Jeep is kind of a Jeep. It's it's The name goes back so far that... In fact, it's become like Kleenex. A lot of I just got an email from somebody uh, who said that they wanted to buy a Jeep, and they gave me a list of somebody from Pakistan, and they gave us a list of cars that they considered Jeeps, and none of them were Jeeps. In other parts of the world, it's pretty cool. Like you said, the word Jeep is like Kleenex. It's yeah. just a four-wheel drive. Yeah. So based on that, then, is a Bronco a Bronco? A Bronco, no. Just a Bronco is a Bronco because it, the, the brand hasn't had that same... Um, Longevity Ooh. and history. Here we've got some fighting words coming. Well, in. It was a Bronco first built. It was built in the '60s. The Jeep goes back to you know pre World War II. It's 1941. Yeah. It's not like it was right. 1832. It's it's, it's 20 it's a, years no, before a, the Bronco. It's not a 20 years before the Bronco. It's, it is 20 years. Yeah, before the Bronco. yeah, but it, it, you know it's iconic. It, it it fought the war. The Bronco didn't fight the war. Do you know Ford built Jeeps? You know, in, in if, any, if anything is, is iconic on the Ford brand, it would be the Mustang. That's much more iconic than the Bronco. Did you know that Ford built military Jeeps? Yes, I know, and they put they stamp Ford on the on there because they were you know they put they, they built Jeeps and then they put Ford on the tailgate of the thing and and the army said knock it off and so Henry Ford is it Henry Ford at the time was he still around? He decided that to distinguish between the Willys and by the way it's Willys or Willis you can say it either way. Overland version of it, you can just, you know, he put Ford on the bolts. And now people who collect those old military World War II Jeeps want the Ford ones for some reason as opposed to the other ones. In some ways, um, the the Ford Bronco kept up with the times better than the Wrangler, or the CJ, I should say, back in the, the era. You know? You're just being a contrarian. Time. No, let's, I just, let's, get, let's get back to our list. Come on. In 1978, when they went to the big Bronco, they kept up with the Blazer, right? <laughs> let's, get, let's, get, let's get back to our list. And uh, Willie's in the AMC was still building this little thing. Do you have any cars that, that you want to add to this? I've got some more, but we could. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, the, the most impressive vehicle I've driven recently, which was just phenomenal, was... Surprisingly great? Yeah. I mean, I thought it would be good, but yeah. it was exceptional, was the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Oh, yeah. I haven't uh, driven it. I've only seen it up close. I think, you know, we've said, we, it's funny, We got, once again, we got an email from somebody who said, stop comparing everything to Tesla. And I wrote back and I said, well, stop comparing everything to Tesla when you guys out there stop caring about, you know, any other electric car but Tesla, right? Because everybody only cares about Tesla. And they, I think they don't understand that, like, the Ionic 5 is, in a way, much better than a Tesla. And... Um, if the word Tesla isn't in a headline or isn't somehow associated with the story, people just yawn. Uh, and they shouldn't because the Ionic 5 and recently Case got to drive the EV6, which is, of course, Kia's version of it. Uh, uh, phenomenal cars. I agree. Yeah, lovely. I think the Ionic 5, I just love the design of it. It yep. looks like a 1980s Lancia Delta Integrale. It's phenomenal to look at. It's got really fast charging, like 10 to 80% in 18 minutes. It's got a beautiful interior, super roomy. It's got like a nap mode when you're charging. It's just a lovely piece of it, design and engineering. And it's cheap for what it is. It starts in the low $40,000 range, maybe even like thirty nine nine. And lovely, lovely, lovely car. Yeah, I was just listening to the Inside EVs podcast. Mm -hmm. Big shout out to those guys. Uh, really entertaining, Martin, uh, Kyle. Uh, but Dominic, I've got a bone to pick with you. He told them the story that he went last weekend and checked out the Ionic 5 at the local dealership uh -huh. and they were asking 5k over sticker and he started making excuses like oh they gotta make money and I'm like dude oh oh wrong 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 thing to say you know uh, if dealers are out there you know doing their dealer shenanigans uh, I, I have a I understand it's a free market but you know we have posted so many uh, pictures and uh, stories about dealers just behaving badly at this moment in time. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing that gets me more riled up than uh, seeing, uh, you know, dealerships. Uh, uh, and this is what he said they did, you know, doing like clear coat uh, and charging $5,000 for it, right? I mean, at least if you're going to do a market 
uh, adjustment. Just be bold about it. Don't don't like hide it in the fact that you're adding a sticker package to it. I remember when I was uh, a young lad, when your grandfather was buying cars, you'd go to a dealership and they would do rust proofing, Tommy, <laughs> yeah. and charge you 500 bucks for it. And nobody ever knew what rust proofing was or what it did, if it did anything. Or they would get those like um, a pin uh, pinstripes that you could buy at your local auto parts store. Right, which you could buy at that time for like 12 bucks and put them on yourself. They would do those and they would charge 500 for them. So I, I really do not like when dealers pretend to add value when in fact all they're doing is making more money. True that, but fantastic podcast. Yes. It's not a, not, Dominic's a great guy. We just. I'm not, I'm trying not to call him out, but <laughs> I guess I did. Sorry, Dominic. Um, I do, I do enjoy the way you open it up and how, how you describe all of the different uh, people and what they do on the podcast. I do love the Ionic 5, though. It, it was. The best car I've driven all year. Uh, phenomenal piece of design, too, inside and out, like little four dots. It's got these little cubes everywhere, these little squares, and that's kind of the design motive. And then you get to, like, the steering wheel, and there's these little four squares, and the four squares are the letter H in Morse code, which is just very clever and lovely piece of design and engineering. So that was one of my biggest surprises of the year, and, and a car I just... That was phenomenal. So big props to them. Um, I've got another one. We just had it at the office. We just drove it yesterday. It was the uh, the new Nissan Pathfinder. Yeah, you know, I went into that thinking um, I was going to be really underwhelmed uh, because obviously Nissan has uh, uh, had its ups and downs. I think that's fair to say with the Pathfinder, right? Obviously, it started out as a body on frame, then went to unibody, body on frame, unibody. So we were expecting body on frame for this fifth generation, and it wasn't. Mm. Uh, so that was disappointing. But they did a couple things that uh, I think are really good. First of all, uh, the exterior design of it. And, and guys, sorry, this podcast is a day late. And the reason for that is we were on vacation last week, Tommy and I. We really try to be consistent, uh, but uh, we just got so backed up that it took us a day longer to get to it, so I apologize. But the reason I brought up the vacation is because there were a ton of rental car uh, pathfinders, and every time I saw one, I, I just did a double take. I, I just looked at it, and I thought, wow, finally that like that V design, a floating roof, uh, it all works in the pathfinder. So they did that. Uh, they finally swapped out the CVT, which everybody's been complaining about in terms of its performance and reliability for for uh, a traditional automatic, uh, and they really upped the quality on the interior, uh, and it, it just seems to hit all of the right uh, notes, you know. So there's nothing like outstanding about it. There's nothing you could say like, oh, "Wow, it's you know, it, it rocks off road," or "It's super quick." Uh, but but everything is just really good about it. Yeah, very solid, well built SUV. Yeah, lots of good interior space. Pretty good third row in it as well. It can tow up to six thousand pounds. So, yeah, I think they, they did a good job with that. The fourth gen was kind of a, uh, it was a little bit of a dud, in my opinion. The, the quality just wasn't there. It had that CVT. Well, and it developed the reputation of the mall finder instead of the pathfinder. Yeah, and the new one, I think they could have gone a little bit more in the opposite direction. A little bit more off-roady, like they should have given it skid plates. Maybe a, like an off-road tire group. Uh, recovery point would have been cool. But it is a very solid, well-built, well-rounded SUV. So I was very surprised with that. I thought that was a, a nice, nice find from Nissan. And then also from Nissan, this is the one that you pointed out, but you like the new Frontier. I do. Before I get to that, let me just do a plug. We were uh, at Thumbleweed Ranch yesterday, and we took the... Uh we took the uh, Pathfinder off-road, uh, and so if you guys want to see how it does off-roady, um, it's over at TFL Off-Road, or you can just go to tfl-studios.com where all of our videos live so that you can have one place shopping, one-stop shopping. Uh, and then the other thing we did, Tommy, which was really fun, is we did uh, a tug-of-war, get this, an epic tug-of-war between all the trucks that we have. So in the end, we ended up Bronco versus TRX, Raptor versus TRX, Tundra versus Titan, just an epic, epic uh, series of tug of wars, and we had a lot of fun uh, and got the car so incredibly muddy that I spent, I think, uh, 20 minutes uh, at the car wash yesterday just hosing off uh, the uh, the Bronco. And when I was there, one of our uh, viewers, I think his name was Duncan, uh, came by, said hi to me. Uh, so I love when you guys do that. Really uh, fun to meet you guys in person. Uh, and the cool thing about it is he's got a 1975 FJ. Uh, that he's come and swapping with the 2.8. Oh, very cool. So he's going he's gonna to bring it in for an episode of Dude, I Love or Hate My Ride. Uh, so I can't wait to actually see that and maybe even get to drive it. So how did the Nissan Pathfinder do in your tug-of-war? Uh, the Pathfinder wasn't in the tug okay. of war. It was all trucks. <laughs> I think it would have done poorly compared to a TRX. I'm just guessing, but... <laughs> 
Probably not so well. Uh, but th that video is going to be up at uh, TFL Off Road this weekend. And it was just so much fun. Uh, you know, I'm, I've never had more fun getting dirtier in my life. So the, the next vehicle I had on the list, as we mentioned, was the Nissan Frontier, which was recently redesigned, um, ground up, which is a good thing because <laughs> it had been the same since about 2004. But the new Nissan Frontier is one of those trucks that is not all that incredible on paper. Like it doesn't excel in the towing or the horsepower wars or or the price wars or whatever, but it's it's a very solid entry that's well designed and well thought out. Yeah, and sorry, Andrea, we're kind of I know we're kind of uh, encroaching on TFL trucks uh, talking truck <laughs> territory here, but I'm, I'm going to encroach some more. It kind of bookends uh, the other truck that I think is surprisingly really great, and um, that's the Rivian. Oh. Uh, so you've got two trucks that are basically kind of mid size -y. The Rivian is, is weird; it's not quite full size. It's not mid size, and you, on one end of the spectrum, you've got the new Frontier. Which, once again, it's one of those vehicles, nothing fantastically outstanding about it, right? So it's not like it doesn't have jets or, you know, it doesn't have uh, uh, four motors uh, per wheel, which the Rivian has. Uh, but it's just a solid, well-designed, basic uh, pickup truck uh, that I think will serve its owners very well for a long time. And the other end of that spectrum, or the other bookend of that, is Rivian, uh, which I thought was surprisingly good uh, for just how technologically advanced and how uh, stunningly capable capable it is and I think you said this Tommy you know it's so impressive that a brand new company was able to create something that good out of the box yeah and it felt pretty well made for what it was like it felt pretty well screwed together it was ridiculously fast um, it, it, it out accelerated our Ram 1500 long term with the V8 towing 8,000 pounds up a mountain so that was pretty amazing but it's just a fantastic I mean mind-blowing vehicle so the Frontier is not gonna blow your mind but it's gonna be a solid dependable long-lived truck the Rivian R1T is just there to just go wow look at that and then I think right in the middle and this is a, a truck that is not much well received online but I think it's gonna do very well and that's the all-new Toyota Tundra right y yeah surprise Surprisingly, people hate it. <laughs> yeah, people are really not into the Tundra on, online and in the comment sections. Yeah, everybody like, you know, everybody like, oh, it's horribly ugly. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, the latest and greatest features. Uh, but yet, you know, we have one and uh, it's done everything we've asked of it. Sure, th there are issues with it. Like, you know, there are issues with every full-size truck. Uh, I just did a little bit of trail damage to it. Unfortunately, I got hooked up on a route and pulled the little plasticky bits off the back. And I started wondering why is there plasticky bits on the back uh, instead of of metal bits, but uh, in general, uh, the truck is solid. The thing I don't understand about, so people are a little upset because it doesn't necessarily move the needle for the full-size truck industry, right? Like it's not the fastest full-size truck. It doesn't have the highest payload or towing numbers. But my answer to that is like, when has a Tundra ever really moved the needle for the full-size truck in terms of numbers or capability, right? Like the Tundra's always been kind of right down the middle, but an incredibly long-lived, very durable, very dependable unit. And of course, people are like pointing at the forums and being like, well, people had wastegate issues. And my answer to that is like, a lot of it is, um, you you have a couple guys on the forums, right, that maybe experience some wastegate issues. Does that mean that your truck's going to start blowing turbos and need the cab off often? No, I mean, who knows what the actual scope of these little these little issues could be. Um, so I, I agree, Tommy. It's important not to get too caught up in these anecdotal situations on the forums. It is, keep in mind, the largest automaker still, right? And Toyota prides itself on its quality. Ours has been perfect, in case you're wondering, in terms of quality. And uh, just a lovely thing to drive around. And we're not being paid by Toyota. I do think the styling's a little weird. Um, and I do think that the user profiles on the screen is not very well implemented. But the interior is beautiful. The, the seats are pretty good. The cab is well insulated. The engine has plenty of power. I really like that twin turbo. Um, it, it's got good offer capability with the TRD offered package. Um, it's a it's a really solid entry. Yeah, and we're going to be doing a really fun video series with it. Uh, we just drove it. One of our guys, Grant, uh, just drove it to California, or is driving it to California today. Uh, we're picking up a Black Series uh, camper. Oh, yeah, that'll be cool. And we're going to yeah. tow it. So we're going to see how it does as a cross-country towing rig, towing a pretty heavy camper. I want to say that camper is like 7,000 out of the box. Uh, and so when you fill it up with the water and stuff and gear, it, it's going to start maxing out that Tundra. So I'm super excited to not only... Uh, test out the camper, but test out the Toyota as a as a you know a cross country tow rig. So be sure to stay tuned for that. A lot of fun stuff coming uh, as soon as we can obviously pick up the camper and do some videos uh, and edit videos and you know do the stuff we usually do. All right, let's go back to cars, Tommy. Yeah. Sorry, Andre. I apologize. I won't step on your toes anymore. Uh, the other one that I, I think is actually surprisingly great. Um, 
and we bought it uh, and then sold it to our videographer um, is the Subaru Crosstrek. I, I really we bought the base car, which was twenty three thousand five hundred, when you could still get them earlier this year, earlier last year, uh, and uh, I was really impressed just by how uh, it did everything really well. If it wasn't for the CVT, and I know there's a manual, but the manual is even worse than the CVT, I would, I would have <laughs> totally been in love with that Why car. is it worse than the CVT? It's, it's the spongiest, most, uh, oh. most like anemic manual you can, you can buy. It actually, the CVT in the case of that little two liter, there's a two liter and a 2.5, right? Right. Uh, makes it more drivable than the, which is quite the trick Subaru. And I, it's kind of a back, I'm being backward compliment. But if you, if you, um, want a really good all-wheel drive car that has a lot of room uh, and uh, has just very practical, uh, down-to-earth, common-sense kind of uh, off-roadiness. Uh, I think that you can't do better than a Crosstrek. I liked it, too. I thought the use of space on the inside was really very, smart. Yeah, easy to get blazing in and out of. Pretty small on the outside, but super big on the inside. The, we had just a basic infotainment screen, worked perfectly, you know, you could hook up your phone to it. Um, it was well made for the most part, it felt really well screwed together, the seats were pretty good, even the basic cloth seats. I really enjoyed driving it, I thought it was, I mean, it's boring to drive, right? It's not quick, it's not particularly dynamic, but it's a solid, comfortable vehicle, had the um, eyesight system, right? Yeah, every, every super, all the Japanese, of course, great. Are, are, are doing standard safety tech. The, the one thing, you guys, if you're listening, that I don't understand is why do you keep Blindside monitoring is a premium one that doesn't get included. I think that's a huge thing, especially for me, because I tend to have a hard time with that for some reason. So I love cars that have blind spot monitoring. Uh, and it's somehow like it's not included in the basic safety tech, right? There's autonomous braking. Now there's the uh, <coughs> lane centering, right? Cruise control, that yada, yada, yada. But for some reason, blind spot monitoring is never part of that package. So I've got another small crossover, which I thought was really good. What is that, Tommy? The Chevy Trailblazer. So the yeah, old... I I have no experience with that. The old Trailblazer was this big lumbering thing with the straight six or the V8 engine, right? And three rows, and it was... Not the Blazer, the Trailblazer. The Trailblazer, yeah. Not the, it's like not the Bronco, the sport, Bronco Sport, not the Blazer, the Trailblazer. But the old Trailblazer was huge. It was right. this enormous family thing. Uh, the new one is this uh, little itty-bitty crossover. It's very angular. It's got these funky lights on it and these weird creases and these funky wheels. And um, uh, it's got a <laughs> three-cylinder engine. I think it's built in Korea. But lovely, lovely, lovely little vehicle. This is another vehicle that's kind of hard to explain on paper, but I spent a few days with it. I even took it off-road, and it was surprisingly great off-road in the active trim. It had a little skid plate and these little off-roady tires. I loved it. I mean, it was um, nice on the inside. It was kind of sporty to drive, a little turbocharged engine, spooled up nicely and zipped along. Fantastic vehicle that I think a lot of people overlook. Now, the full-size Blazer, that's a whole other story. That one, I think, is a missed opportunity. It should have been a Bronco competitor. But the Trailblazer, for what it is, it's a good little vehicle. All right, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I think that, uh, once again, we're going to go back to the Koreans because both Hyundai and Kia are knocking out of the ballpark pretty much in every car they built. I think, you know, another car that I don't want to talk about because obviously people know that how great this one is, is uh, the Telluride or the Palisade, right? Yep. Those two are, Ooh, yeah. Are, yeah, are known. But the ones that I think are still under the radar a little bit are the N versions. There's three of them now, right? There's the Kona, the Elantra, and the one I think, actually, sorry, Veloster, Elantra, and the one I love is a Kona because that's a little crossover that they turned into basically a hot hatch crossover where uh, this is an interesting uh, market segment that I'm glad that they're exploring. Yeah, ph phenomenal, right? right? And even, like, I was just talking to Paul, a race car driver, and he is very critical about vehicle dynamics. He he is really finely tuned into how a vehicle performs and its pros and cons, and um, he usually hates SUVs and crossovers on the track, but he came off of that program with the Elantra N, which is a car, and the Kona N, which is a crossover, and he preferred the Kona. He said it was such a well-dampened, uh, well-calibrated vehicle. He fell in love with the Kona, so I really am impressed by that. So, uh, big props them. Also, honorable shout out, my grandma just bought a Venue, which is this itty bitty little Hyundai. I mean, it's like the little square one. Um, I think it starts at like 16 or 17 grand or something. Fantastic vehicle. Front wheel drive, tiny engine, little CVT, but it's like it's like my Cyan XP. Same thing. Holds a lot of stuff, dirt cheap to run, great warranty. And, and I gotta say, I'm, I'm kind of really into cars where it's not all screens. I'm getting really tired of touch screens because everybody seems to have gone to the Q system, which was the world's worst infotainment system that Cadillac engineered, what was it, like eight years ago, and we, we just laughed at it, and now people are turning to it, and it's terrifying. So I love cars that actually have real buttons. There's just some things that, you know, 
are much easier to control, like HVAC stuff, right? Why do you have to like switch screens, find the right uh, you know component of it before you can like turn up your heat or turn down your air conditioning? It's just much nicer to have a feel, real button that does that. Yeah. Um, so another vehicle I think is surprisingly good, which is often overlooked. Yeah. Uh, we bought it long term, but the Mini Cooper SE. So the this is the the, the tiny Mini. I think that's the definition of surprisingly great. Yeah, and it's it's basically what they did is they took the gasoline mini, they tore out the engine, and then they took all the stuff from the old i3, right, and they just plopped it in there. So the old BMW stuff with the battery and all the, the motors and stuff. But it, it's a great car. It only goes about 114 miles on a single charge. Starts at 30K. You can get the $7,500 tax credit for it. Super fun to drive, beautiful interior. You can get some incredible colors. You can get a three-tone roof where they paint. I think they're the only ones that do a three-tone <laughs> yeah. roof. Yeah, I was talking to um, one of the, the, the product guys about that, and they're like, well, yeah, it's very hard to paint three different colors on one roof panel. And it's not a wrap. It's actually paint. Um, but it's a really very cool car. Yeah, that might, that might be one that I actually might buy personally. So the company owns it right now, and we have this deal here where if the company buys it, and then we go to sell it, any of the employees can buy it at whatever cost that we bought it for. Uh, and that's actually, you might think that that is not a great deal, but given the way that we buy cars and we get them at either MSRP or below, it tends to be a really good deal. Uh, and so that one might be one that is so, it's so good that I personally may want to hold on to that one. A very few car, you know, we're not in the business of collecting cars. Uh, we're in the business of reviewing cars, but that might be one uh, that uh, I might want to hold on to. Uh, once again, I think it uh, came out of left field, right? Nobody saw it coming. Uh, and so uh, I think Mini does, does, does probably not a good enough job of promoting that, of, of saying how good it is. Uh, and that's unfortunate because it, it takes Mini back to what Mini should be, which is, uh, you know, a grown-up version of a go-kart. Yeah, I think the gas ones are kind of, especially if you look at like the Cooper S, you can get them in like thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine thousand dollars, and then they don't perform as well as like a Golf GTI. And then your question is like, why not get a Kona N or a, something like that? But the Cooper SE is kind of in a class of its own. It's pretty affordable for an electric car, and it's lovely, lovely, lovely to drive. So the next vehicle on our list on the opposite end of the spectrum, but um, the Jeep Wrangler is not really surprising. But what is surprising is I recently bought that base model. Yeah, you bought the Willys. No, you bought the, uh, what did you buy? It's the, um, I can't think of it now. It's called the Willys Sport. Yeah, the Willys Sport. So it's like full on bare bones, but it's got some cool tires and, and the rock rails and that kind of thing. Um, but, I mean, it's got no power windows. It's got no power mirrors, no power locks. Yeah. It doesn't have heated seats. It's, it's crazy like how everybody wants, and I'm not sure this is happening. I think, I think Ford learned this lesson, and so they came out with a bunch of different model designations. The, the Jeep basically has, right, the basic one, then they have a Sahara, and then they have a Renegade. And for some reason, everybody in the Wrangler wants the um, Rubicon. Sorry, so they have a basic, Sahara, Rubicon, uh, right? And they all, everybody wants that Rubicon. Uh, and the fact is, you don't need the Rubicon because the out-of-the-box base Wrangler is more competent than 99% of any car on the road. So how does this, if you look at what Ford did with the Bronco. Off-road at least. Ford perfectly matched the Wrangler trim line. It's like base is sport. And then there's uh, Big Bend is Sport S. And then uh, what, what Black Diamond is Willys. And Outer Banks is Sahara. So they like perfectly matched them up, which I think is smart. But You the, think so? You think that's, how, you think that's oh, what they did? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I'm not sure about that. Oh, <laughs> Dad. It, it's like no, you can well, see it option for well, option. Is The other problem there is that, that Jeep has done so many different versions that even, even if you take like the six trim levels of the Bronco, if you look over the last, let's say, two year, even two years, right, there have been so many different trim levels. The Islander, the Black Dragon, uh, the Call of Duty, and I'm just thinking of these <laughs> at the top of my head, right? All these special. So I, I think Jeep has completely muddied the water in terms of, you, you know. You it, do it, have, to, you have to cut through the, the, the chaff a little bit because, like, uh, what, like, they've got a model called the, I think it's called the High Altitude or something. And the High Altitude is just a Sport S with different wheels. Like, an Islander was a sport with different wheels and some stickers. Right, but it really confused and muddied the water. But uh, if you look at like the main trim lines, you got Sport, Sport S, Willys, Sahara, Rubicon. I, I, I completely disagree with you. I think, like I was talking to this guy yesterday, right? He was looking for a Badlands version for his mom, That's right? a Rubicon. Right? Yeah. Right, but, but um, 
Well, and then you have the Sasquatch package on top of that. Sasquatch does get a little different. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. but yeah. now you've got the Extreme Recon, though, to combat the Sasquatch package. But, but you see what I'm saying? Like, he knew exactly what, what he wanted. Whereas if you walk into a Jeep dealership for the longest time, you'd be like, oh, there's a Jeep. Oh, there's that's the Black Dragon. And that's the, um, what's, what's, there was a Big Bear, right? Or was the Bear one? Uh, Black Bear. You see what I'm saying? There was like the black bear, and they all had like, oh, the black bear is the only one that's a base one that gets you a locking rear diff. It got very confusing. Yeah, well, first of all, you the thing about the Jeep Special Editions yeah. is like for the most part, for the vast most part, stuff, about Wranglers. Though. Yeah, Wranglers. Mm. Stuff like locking rear diffs, you couldn't get on any of the Special Editions. Like if you get an Islander, it's some stickers. Except for that one. That was the only way you could get the locking rear diff. There was like one where you could do some like it, fun it was, stuff. Uh, was it the Black Bear? I think it was the Black Bear. I don't remember what it was called. But, Dad, think about how many Special Editions you got. Oscar Mike, Black Dragon, um, Islander, Altitude, High Altitude, right? They're all just trims oh, and there wheels. Was, there was the one, uh, like the, for, the frost one. What was the one? Oh, uh, there was uh, the wintry one. Wintry one, yeah. Uh, yeah, but they're just they're stickers and trims and stickers and colors and wheels. But you see what I'm saying? That muddied the water, and so I think I think people actually understand the trim levels. Ford has been much more um, disciplined. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, and then now there's like the ultra luxury Jeep. I don't remember what that one's called, where it's got 20 inch wheels and color right. match bumpers and whatever. So, yeah, Ford is – do you think they're going to come out with their own special editions? I mean, they're already coming out with the um, snorkely one. What's that called? Yeah, what is the snorkely one called? Um, um, I should, Everglades. Everglades, The yeah. one with the snorkel. And now and there's the, a Raptor version of and it. And now there's a Raptor, Raptor, right? And then there's a Wild Track, which is – I think Raptor may become like Prius. It's going to become its own brand. That's that's the way oh, it's heading. okay. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. it'll be like a Raptor F-150. A Raptor what about a Raptor one. Ranger? Is there going to be a Raptor Ranger? There could it be. It probably yeah. would make yeah. sense to yeah. have a Raptor So Ranger. it's going to be like Prius where it's its own sub-brand. So, anyways, um, where are going with this? The Jeep Wrangler base model, with none of the options, has been very good to live with. I thought I'd miss the heated seats and the heated steering wheel and the power mirrors, but, like, you don't need any of that stuff on a daily basis. Power locks would be good, because I, I do get kind of tired of having to lock the doors manually with the key or reaching over to unlock the doors, right? But power windows, don't miss them at all. Uh, the big screen, the big radio, don't miss it at all. I still have Bluetooth. Um, the fancy gauges, don't miss any of that. I mean, it's amazing how much money you spend on stuff. We really don't need to spend that much money and still have a usable, livable vehicle. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, looking from a 2022 uh, February perspective, you paid how much for that? Uh, the MSRP was 33 and I paid 31 Yeah, it seems like just one hell of a bargain. <laughs> but that was high to COVID, too. That right. was like... Right. One hell... I mean, just less than a year ago... you. It's been six months, right, since you bought it. Yeah, I think I got it in yeah. – I ordered it in April of 21, yeah. and then I took delivery in, like, June. Right now, right now, people would be, like, clawing at the dealership windows I know. to, to yeah, buy that. Yeah, it's so sad. Vehicle. And we, find, we actually got two of them, right, because you ordered a base one. It's hilarious. You ordered well, the base one, and then and then, then, and Jeep, then, then Jeep's uh, – and then, and then someone at Jeep was like, ah, you may want to actually get this one. Well, if who you're, was someone? Come on. say who, Don't just say someone. If you're gonna well, say the it. head of Jeep got a hold of my order. Mr. Morrison, yeah. Yeah, and then there was out. a meeting that was held, and then someone reached out and said, um, excuse me, Tommy, the head of Jeep thinks that you should probably buy the, uh, the off-roady one. And then I was like, okay. Um, but I didn't want to really spend much more money, but it turned out to be worth and, it. And so the, the, we usually people ask us, what rec dealership do you recommend? And we buy ours at Johnson's Auto Plaza. Uh, yep. But uh, in that era, you could get a slight deal on them too. So MSRP was 33, and I think I, I, I bought mine for 31, and then with taxes and, it was 35. Anyway, you got the, they, they delivered the base one for Well, I told, them, I, I, I told them to cancel the base one because Johnson was worried that they would be stuck with the stripper. Uh, that that's where I'm going with this. Steel wheels. I mean, the one I initially ordered was like, Full rental car spec. I mean, it was steel wheels, street tires, uh, nothing on it except for air conditioning. But the irony here is that Johnson's was like, oh, my God, we've well, got Well, Ryan this. was really worried about selling it. He's like, who's going to buy this? Yeah, and now, now who's he this could, bean can? Yeah, now if he had 20 of them, they'd be gone like that. You he know? didn't actually sell that one, though. Of course he sold it. Someone someone in the Colorado area has a red Wrangler that says Thomas Micah on the window yeah, sticker. Yeah, because it, it says when you order a custom <laughs> order, it says, it says your name. So whoever got it here in Colorado, congratulations. Uh, smart buy. You you were smart. You could probably flip that thing for at least 5K more than you paid but for But, like, it. buying the base model, everyone thinks they want a base model. Yeah. But Brian is like, people want power windows. They want a hard top. No one in Colorado wants a soft top. So he's worried about selling it, and he sold it pretty quickly. Well, guys, those are just some of the surprisingly great cars that we've driven. Uh, there's a bunch of honorable mentions. Uh, I'll go into a, a couple of them really quick. I really love the new S-Class. Yep, very good. It could be because I'm getting old and comfortable and, <laughs> and love luxury. Uh, but I was really surprised by that. That was one that... 
that I was really so sorry to see go. Uh, how about you? Any others? Um, yeah, I like the BMW 3 Series plug-in hybrid. Yeah, I thought that, that was, was pretty really cool. Good. Yeah. Uh, the TLX, I think, is actually really good. Yeah, Acura. Yeah, um, the TLX was really good. It, yeah. have, it definitely included that on, on the main list. Yeah, here. there's there's a bunch more, but we're running out of time. Uh, so if there's any cars that you guys uh, think we've missed or that you've bought and you were like, wow, this turned out to be surprisingly great or <laughs> surprisingly, surprisingly bad, bad <laughs> let us know in the comments below. Maybe we'll do the flip side of the coin on the next podcast. Uh, thank you for spending, what, about an hour with myself and Tommy. Uh, Tommy, I know you've got a lot more meetings to go to. It's been crazy this week because you're trying to get caught up with everything. But we've got some really great videos, and hopefully you understand. Uh, you got a preview of what's coming. I can't wait to uh, publish that uh, um, uh, tug of war. Tug of war, yeah, that was yeah. cool because Car Wow did one, and it got me really excited to do our own version of it. And I think since we had access to cars and trucks that they don't have, and now a place to do it, we thought, why not? Yeah, for sure. So we'll be sure to keep you in the loop on all that, but be sure to stay tuned for another TFL Talk podcast. And finally, thank you to all of our Patreons. Oh, uh, yep. You guys make this is possible. Is it patrons or Patreons? I don't know. The it's website's Patreon, name. but the... Is it a patron? Is it a patron? I think I it's a patron. I don't know. I and all of our supporters, fans. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> super fans. You guys are the best. See you next time. Ciao.